Hi, welcome to this lecture on symbol tables. Here's the outline for this lecture. We'll first talk about what a symbol table is. It's basically a data structure that maps keys to values. And then we will talk about the API for the symbol table data structure. And then we will talk about sample client programs that make use of the symbol table API. And then we will discuss two implementations of the symbol table API. And then we will compare their performance characteristics. So what is a symbol table? Well, a symbol table is a data structure for key value pairs. And it supports two fundamental operations. One is uh, the insert operation, which puts a new key value pair into the symbol table. And the other operation is the search operation, which returns the value associated with uh, a key. Okay? And the insert operation is usually called uh, put, and the search operation is typically called get. Right? So conceptually, a symbol table is a data structure that looks like a table. Right? And it maps keys to values. So you have some key k1 mapping to value v1, some key k2 mapping to value v2, and so on. Right? So that's what a symbol table is. And it supports these two fundamental operations, namely put, which inserts a new key value pair into the symbol table, and get, which returns the value associated with a key. There are many, many applications of the symbol table data structure. And here in this table, I just show you uh, some of them. Okay. So for example, if you were to model a dictionary um, uh, in, in your program, then you would use a symbol table uh, for that purpose. And the key in that case is going to correspond to words in the dictionary. And the values are going to correspond to the definitions. Right? So, um, you would have words mapping to definitions. Another example is a book index. Um, so here the goal is to find the relevant pages that contain a certain uh, term or concept in a book. And if you were to use a symbol table to represent a book index, then the keys are going to be terms. Okay, And then the values are going to be a list of page numbers. Right? So it would look something like this. So you would have a symbol table where um, the keys are going to be terms. So keys, values. Um, so you would have something like a term, let's say T1, and this would map to a list of page numbers, right? such as 4, 75, 100, and so on. So these are basically the page numbers in the book that contain that particular term. Okay, um, so that's a nice example where you could use a symbol table as the underlying data structure. Um, another example is a file sharing application where the purpose is to find um, songs to download. So here, if you use a symbol table, you would um, store the names of songs as the keys and the value would be uh, the computer ID, right? Um, so this would be the ID of the computer that uh, stores that song. Right? Another example is web search, where the goal is to find relevant web pages. So here, if you use, if you model this application as a simple table, then the keys are going to be keywords or the search terms, and the values are going to be uh, a list of page names. So these are pages that contain that keyword. Okay. So this is something that uh, uh, Google does as a search engine. Okay. Um, another example is a compiler where you want to find the uh, type and value associated with a variable. So there, a symbol table is a natural data structure to consider. So the keys are going to be variable names and the values are going to be uh, their types and values. Okay. So these are just a, a few uh, applications where you would uh, use a symbol table as the underlying data structure.
Now, when we talk about um, the implementation of the simple table API, um, we will use certain conventions, right, in our implementations. And these are the conventions that we're going to follow. So we're going to make sure that there are no duplicate keys in our, um, our data structure, in the simple table data structure, okay? Um, when a client tries to put a key value pair into the table that already contains that key, okay, then what we do is we have the new value replace the existing value, okay? So, so, so what we're saying here is that um, if there is in your symbol table um, a key, let's say uh, k, mapping to some value, uh, let's say k1, mapping to some value v1, and then if the client tries to put a, a key value pair k1 with value v2, notice that this k1 already exists in the symbol table. So what we do in that case is simply uh, replace the current value v1 with this new value v2. Okay, so that's what we're saying here. So we don't create a new entry for this key value pair. Instead, we simply update the current value with the new one. Okay, so we're not going to allow duplicate keys in the symbol table. The next convention that we're going to follow is the keys will not um, uh, 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 be allowed to take on the value null, right? So the keys cannot be null. And then we'll also make sure that no key is associated with the value null, right? So if the client makes a call to the put operation um, or the insert operation with the key value pair, let's say k and null, uh, we are going to treat this operation. So if the client says put that, we're going to treat this as a delete operation, right? Uh, so this is going to map to a delete operation with that key, right? So we're going to remove this key from the symbol table and its associated value. So that's another convention. And then the way we're going to implement delete is we're going to, uh, so if the client um, makes a call to delete with some key as an argument, we're going to remove that key from the symbol table and the associated value immediately, all right? So, so, so these are all the conventions that we're going to follow when uh, we implement the symbol table API. So let's go through this again, this is somewhat important. So we're not going to allow duplicate keys, all right? So if the client uh, makes a call to the put operation with a key value pair where the key already exists in the symbol table, we are simply going to overwrite the existing value with the new value. Okay? The next convention is we are not going to uh, allow the keys to be null. So keys can never be null. And then we are also not going to allow the value of null uh, for any key. So if the client makes a call to the put operation um, with the value null, we're going to treat it as a delete operation and delete the corresponding key okay, and the associated value. Um, and then uh, we are also going to make sure that when the client makes a call to the delete operation with a certain key, we remove the key and the associated value from the symbol table immediately. So now let's talk about the API for the symbol table data structure. We're going to discuss two different APIs. The first one um, is called the basic symbol table API, and that is what you see here. So let's uh, go through the methods in here, right? So, um, so first of all, there is a constructor that's, uh, that we don't show here that lets you build a symbol table, an empty symbol table with no key value pairs. Right? So there is a constructor usually. And then once you have an object of type symbol table, then these are the things that you can do with the basic symbol table API. You can ask for the size of the symbol table, which simply returns the number of key value pairs in the table. Right? And then you can check if the symbol table is empty or not using this method. And then you can check if a certain key is contained in the symbol table using this predicate method. And then using this method get, you can get the value associated with the given key. Okay? And if this key is not in the symbol table, this method is going to return null. 
right? And then you can use this method to insert a key value pair into the symbol table, right? And then, uh, so here we're going to follow the convention that we discussed, which is that if this key is already in the symbol table, the current value will be updated to this value. Right? And then the other uh, thing that we will do is if this value is null, we're going to treat it as a delete operation. Okay, And then this method can be used to delete the given key and the associated value from the symbol table. And then finally, this method can be uh, used to obtain an iterable object with which to iterate over the keys in the symbol table. Right, So, so this method simply returns an iterable object for the client to iterate over the keys of the symbol table, right? Um, okay, and then uh, just one thing to note, which is that these keys and values, they are generic types, okay? So they can be objects of any type. Now let's discuss another API, the second symbol table API, which is called the ordered symbol table API. It's called ordered because it's going to support, as we will see, uh, what are called ordered operations, okay? So here again, there is a constructor which is not shown here with which you can build an empty symbol table. And then once you have a symbol table, you can ask for its size, meaning the number of key value pairs in the symbol table. And then you can check using this method if the symbol table is empty or not. You can use this method to check if the given key is contained in the symbol table. You can use this method to get the value associated with the given key or null if the key doesn't exist in the simple table. And then you can use this operation, um, which is an ordered operation, to find the number of keys that are strictly less than the given key. Okay, that's what this method does. It returns the number of keys in the symbol table that are strictly less than the given key. Okay. Um, and then you can use this operation to insert the given key value pair into the symbol table. Again, we will stick to the conventions that we discussed. And then this method allows you to delete a given key and the associated value from the symbol table. And then this method allows you to uh, delete the smallest key in the symbol table. All right. Um, um, and the associated value, right? And this method allows is to delete the largest key in the symbol table and the associated value. These two methods return the minimum and the maximum uh, keys in the symbol table. And then this method here is the opposite of the rank method. All right? So this, given a rank of a key, returns a key with that rank. Right? So it returns a key in the symbol table that has this rank meaning it returns a key in the symbol table that has these many elements that are strictly less than that uh, 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 key, okay? And then this method here, floor, uh, takes a key as an argument and it returns the largest key that is less than or equal to the given key, right? So if the uh, given key is in the symbol table, then the floor is that key itself because that is the largest key that is less than or equal to that key. But if the given key is not in the symbol table, then floor is going to return the largest key that is um, less than that key, okay? And then ceiling is um, the smallest key that is greater than or equal to the given key. So if the given key is in the symbol table, ceiling is going to be that key itself. Otherwise, it's going to be the smallest key in the symbol table that is greater than that key, all right? Um, and then size is simply going to return the number of keys uh, that are in the range low to high, where low and high are both inclusive, okay? And then keys is going to give you an iterable object um, that consists of keys that are from this interval low through high. Again, low and high are both inclusive, okay? And it's going to be uh, re uh, 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 returned in a sorted order, okay? So this iterable object simply contains the keys uh, in the symbol table that are between low and high in sorted order. And then this keys gives you an iterable, iterable object that contains all the keys in the symbol table in sorted order, right? So, so these, are the, uh, these are all the methods in the ordered symbol table API. Now here, there's something to keep in mind, which is that um, the, the keys and values are both uh, generic types, meaning the keys and values can be objects of any type. And in addition, uh, unlike the, the basic symbol table API, here the keys 
need to be comparable okay because only then you can implement these ordered operations right so keep it and keep that in mind and the ordered symbol api, uh, API uh, ordered symbol table api the keys need to be comparable all right So now let's discuss a couple of client programs. Uh, the first one of which is going to make use of the uh, basic symbol table API. And the second one is going to make use of the ordered symbol table API. All right, so let's start with the, the first one uh, that uses the basic symbol table API. So this client program is basic, is actually a, a, a test client and it sits right in, uh, inside of this program called sequential search st okay and this uh, program we'll see later uh, is basically an implementation of the basic symbol table api right and this main inside of that program is simply a test client right okay so let's um, go through the program so the first thing that we do here is create an empty symbol table api right so this symbol table api uh, 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 sorry so what we do here is create uh, an object called st of type sequential search st, okay, which is a data type that implements the basic symbol table API. Okay, now this symbol table maps strings to integers. Okay, so in this symbol table, the keys are going to be objects of type string, and the values are going to be objects of type integer, right? So uh, so we create an empty symbol table, uh, table and then what we do is in this for loop we simply read uh, keys from standard input okay so i goes from uh, zero uh, until uh, uh, the, the standard input is not empty in increments of one right and what we do in each iteration is read a string from standard input we call that key and then we simply insert that key into the symbol table st with the value i, right? Um, and then once the for loop is uh, done, uh, we have the symbol table populated with keys and values, okay? Uh, where the keys are strings and the values are integers. And then what we do here is simply uh, iterate over the keys of the symbol table. And the way we do that is by calling the keys method of the symbol table, which returns an iterable object containing all the keys. So we simply iterate through that keys, right? So in each iteration here, S is going to be a key from the symbol table, and we print that along with the associated value, okay? And the way we get the associated value is by making a call to the get method from the symbol table API, right? So that's the, the, uh, the program. And um, notice that the places where we uh, call methods from the symbol table API are here, which is the insert operation that inserts a key value pair into the symbol table. And then this method here, which returns an iterable object that contains all the keys in the symbol table. And then this method here, which gets the value associated with a given key, all right? So now let's look at some input and output. So we run this program as such, Right, so we are running this uh, test client, and in standard input we specify all these strings. Right, so s is a string, e is a string, and so on, all the way up to this last string, uh, e. Right? And then we send the end of file signal, and the program comes back with this output. So what are we uh, seeing here? Well, um, here we are basically creating a symbol table where the keys are strings and the values are integers. So the first string is s, so that is entered with the index zero, okay? Because initially i was zero. And then we see an e that is entered with index one. And then we see an a that is um, uh, inserted with the, uh, the value two, because that's its index. r is entered with index three. And then c is entered with index four and then h is um, uh, inserted with index five. Let me just separate these guys. And then comes e. So this now is going to be inserted with the, uh, 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 as the pair e and six, 
right? Because uh, the index of this guy is six. But notice that this E already is in the symbol table. Okay, so what does the convention say? Well, in that case, we replace the existing value with the new value, which is six, right? Um, okay, so, so that's that's what we do. And then comes X, which we insert with um, the value seven. And then comes A, but A is already in the symbol table. So when we try to insert A with the index eight, then we simply replace the corresponding value with um, eight, okay? And then comes M, which is inserted with uh, the value nine, all right? And then P is inserted with um, 10, And then L is inserted with 11, but L is already in the symbol table. So in this case, we simply replace it with uh, the value with 11. Okay? And then E is inserted. So L was inserted with 11. And then E is inserted with 12, but E is already in the symbol table. So we replace this, the current value 6, with the value 12. Okay? And then we are done processing all the input. And this is what we have in the symbol table. Okay, and that's exactly what you see here. Okay. okay, so now let's look at another client program. This is a performance client that makes use of the ordered symbol table API to do something interesting, right? So this program is called um, Frequency Counter, and what it does is it reads words from standard input and it simply reports on the most frequent word, the number of distinct words, and the total number of words um, that it processed. Right? So that's what the program does. So let's walk through the code. We first initialize a couple of variables, distinct to zero and words to zero. So distinct is going to store the number of distinct words, and words is going to store the, number of, uh, the total number of words. And then we get a command line argument as an integer. We call it min length. So we're going to consider words that are longer than this uh, length, okay? So any word that is shorter than this length are going, uh, are going to be, uh, is going to be ignored. And then we create an empty symbol table, um, and this is an ordered symbol table, and the particular implementation that we consider uh, uh, is uh, called binary search ST, okay? So this symbol table object, which we call ST, maps strings to integers. So the, the keys are going to be strings or words, and the values are going to be integers, which are going to be the, the frequency of each word. Okay, so, so that's that. And then in this while loop, what we're doing is we're processing words from standard input. So as long as the standard input is not empty, we read a word, we call it key, and then we simply ignore it if its length is less than min length. Okay, so if that's the case, we continue and read the next word. Otherwise, if it meets the length requirement, what we do is we increment the total number of words by one, okay, because we just saw uh, another word, and then we check if that word uh, is in the symbol table or not. So we make a call to the contains method from the symbol table API. And if that is true, then what does it uh, uh, mean? Well, it means that this key is already in the symbol table. So what we do is we get its value, which is its current frequency, okay, by making a call to the get method. And then we increment that frequency by one, which is that guy, and use as the new, use that as the new value for that word. Okay, so we are simply incrementing the frequency of that word by one. So we say st.put the same key along with this new value, which is its uh, uh, frequency incremented by one, okay? And remember, what does our convention say? Well, it says that the word is already in the symbol table, uh, simply update its value to this uh, new value, okay? That's exactly what we want. So if the key is already in the symbol table, we are simply incrementing its frequency by one. Otherwise, what we do is we insert the, the uh, uh, key into the symbol table, with the frequency one, because this is the first time you're seeing the key, okay? And then, since this is the first time you're seeing the key, you increment the distinct variable by one, 
right? Okay, so once um, this while loop is done, uh, you have the symbol table completely populated with uh, the words from the input, from standard input, along with the corresponding frequencies, right? And then all that we need to do is figure out uh, uh, the, uh, the, the most frequent uh, word, okay? And that's what we're trying to do here. So we uh, create a variable called max and initialize it to empty, and we simply put it into the symbol table with frequency zero. Okay, so we uh, we simply take you know, the key value pair uh, empty string and zero and throw it into the symbol table, right? And then we walk through the keys in the symbol table, which are uh, the, the words, right? So uh, we simply walk through each word and then we get its corresponding frequency and we compare that with, um, uh, <clears throat> with the frequency of the current uh, max word. Okay, and if that is greater, then we say the, the new max is that particular word because its frequency is greater than the frequency of the current max word. Okay, so that's what we do. So once this for loop is done, we have identified the word that has the highest frequency, right? The most frequent word. And that fre uh, most frequent word is stored in max. Okay, all right. Um, and then we simply write some output. So the first thing that we write is that most frequent word along with its corresponding frequency. Okay? And then we write the number of distinct words, which is simply given by the value of this variable distinct. And finally, we write the total number of words, which is simply the value of this variable words. Right? Let's look at some input and output now. So here we run this program frequency counter with a min length of eight and we simply feed it this file as standard input, right? Um, and the, pro, uh, the, the program says that the most frequent word in this file is business, and it has a frequency of 122. So this word business occurs in this file 122 times. And then the program says that the number of distinct words in that file um, is 5,126 and the total number of words is 14,346, right? So, so, that's, uh, so that's a nice uh, client program called Frequency Counter that makes use of um, an ordered symbol table API to, to uh, report on frequency counts, right? In a text corpus. Now let's talk about implementing the symbol table API. So we're going to first discuss the implementation of the basic symbol table API. And for that implementation, we're going to use a linked list as the underlying data structure, right? And this implementation is called sequential search ST. And its keys and values are both generic types, right? Meaning the keys and the values in the symbol table can be objects of any type. Here are the two instance variables. The first one is called n. That's a primitive int, and that's simply going to store the number of key value pairs in the symbol table. And then this instance variable is called first, and that's simply a pointer to the first node in the underlying uh, linked list, right? And here is the representation of the linked list, right? So it's a private class called node, and each node contains uh, three things, right? So let's uh, talk about this in some detail. So each node uh, in the linked list contains a key, a generic key, and then a generic value, and then a pointer to the next node in the linked list, right? So this guy is going to have a generic key, a generic value, and a pointer to the next node, and so on, right? Until the last node, which is also going to have a key, a value, and a pointer to null. Okay, and first is basically a pointer to the very first node in the linked list, right? So each node stores the key value pairs and also a pointer to the next node in the linked list, right? So, so that's what we have here. 
for instance variables and then we also provide a constructor so that we can conveniently build an object of type node right and the constructor simply takes a key a value and a pointer to the next uh, node and assigns those to the instance variables right so key is assigned to this dot key value is assigned to this dot value and next is assigned to this dot next right so that's our representation of the underlying linked list so now let's go through the uh, the methods in the api so the constructor is trivial right uh, we do nothing right and um, so this is the constructor that lets us build an empty symbol table api uh, an empty symbol table and we uh, and what this will do to the instance variables uh, is simply initialize them to, to zero and a null for first, right? And you could also be explicit if you want. You can here in the body say n equals zero and first equals null, right? So that's what the constructor does. And then for size, we simply return n because n stores uh, the number of key value pairs in the symbol table. And then is empty simply compares the size of the symbol table, which is the value of n with zero. So that's uh, simple. And then contains is very simple once you have get in place. Okay. So uh, what is contain supposed to do? It is supposed to return true if key is in the symbol table and false otherwise. So what we do for implementation is simply call the get method on that given key and compare that with null. So if the return value of get is not equal to null, it means that the symbol table is not empty, so we return true. Otherwise, we return, uh, return false, okay? So contains relies on uh, get. Now let's talk about get. So we are given a key and we are supposed to return the corresponding value if the key is in the symbol table um, or null if the key is not in the symbol table. So how do we implement this? Well, we simply walk through this linked list starting at the first node. So we say x is first, and then as long as x is not equal to null, we update x by saying x is x dot next, okay? Um, so in the body, what we do is we compare the given key uh, with the key in the node. So initially, we compare the given key with this key. If we have a match, we return the corresponding value. But if it's not a match, then x is updated to x dot next, which is this node. So now we compare the given key with the key in x, if it's a match, we simply return the corresponding value. Otherwise, we go to the next node and, and so on and so on and so on. Okay? And if we never um, uh, found a match, we end up returning null. Okay? So, so that's how get works. So what about the, the running time for get? Well, in the worst case, we have to scan the entire linked list. So get is a linear operation. And what about contains? Well, contains relies on get. So contains is also a linear operation. And these guys is empty size in the constructor. They're all constant time operations, all right? What about the put method? Well, um, the first thing that we do is we check if the given value is null. So remember, our convention says that if the value is null, we treat it as a delete operation. So in that case, we simply call delete with the given key and return. Right? But if the value is not null, what we do is we check if this given key is already in the symbol table or not. Okay, um, Because if it is, then we need to update the corresponding value with this value. So how do we check if this key is in the symbol table? Well, it just takes a scan of the underlying linked list. So x starts at first, and as long as x is not equal to null, x is updated as x equals x dot next. And then we compare the given key with the key in the... Uh, in the node and if we have a match then we simply say update the current value with the given value right and return okay so if the given key is in the symbol table we simply update its value to the given value otherwise we keep going and if we end up here then it would mean that this key value this key is a new key that is not in the symbol table so what do we do in that case well we simply create a new node for this key value pair. So it's a new node with the given key, given value, and the current first becomes the, the, the next node, okay? So we say first is now a new node whose next node is the current first, right? And then we, since we inserted a new key value pair, we increment n by one, right? So that's put operation. And 
what's the running time here? Well, this is also linear because uh, because of this scan here, okay? That walks through the, the, uh, the entire linked list in the worst case. Okay, now let's talk about the delete operation. Well, delete is broken down into two methods, two overloaded methods. We have the public delete method, which calls the private delete method, okay? So the public delete method simply takes a key that we want deleted and it calls the private delete method that um, <clears throat> takes uh, a node as the first argument and the key that we want to delete as the second argument and it simply returns a pointer to a node all right so um, so that's what the private method does and um, uh, and uh, in the public delete method we simply call the private delete method giving it first as the first argument so first is assigned to x and then key for the second argument and whatever is returned by delete is assigned back to uh, first okay so let's look at the the private delete method and the private delete method is recursive so what are we doing here well since it's recursive we need a base case and the base case says if x is null simply return null all right Otherwise, what we do is we compare the given key with the key in the node X. And if we have a match, then we know that that's the node that we want to delete, right? So what do we do in that case? Well, we simply decrement N by one because we are taking out that node and then we return a pointer to the next node to the caller, right? Um, so uh, we simply say, um, so if this is, so let's uh, say we have our linked list pointing to another element here, pointing to another element here, and so on. And let's say that when we got uh, to this particular node here, so this particular node, let's say we had a match. So the given key matched the key in this node so which means that this is the node that we want to delete right so what do we do in that case we decrement n by one and then we simply return so x is pointing to this node we simply return x dot next which is this guy to the uh, to the caller uh, that initiated the delete operation on this node which was basically the delete operation on this guy so a pointer to this one is returned to this one and that's how we get this assignment here from this guy to this guy, all right? And this link is gone, all right? And that's what uh, 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 we do here, all right? So there's nothing pointing to this node which gets garbage collected, all right? But if this is not the case, then we uh, what we do is we make a recursive call to delete, which is this method. Um, so we say delete x dot next, so if we didn't have a match here, we simply make a recursive call on the, the next node. So that's this call here, delete x dot next with the given key as an argument. And whatever that returns is assigned to x dot next. Okay, and then finally we return x. So that's how um, the, the uh, delete operation works. And the running time for delete is also linear, all right? because the node that we are trying to delete um, might not exist in the linked list, in which case we have to traverse the entire linked list. Okay, what about the keys method? Well, recall that keys is supposed to return an iterable object that contains all the keys in the symbol table. So how do we implement it? Well, we create a queue um, uh, as an object of type Q, and we say that its objects are going to be of type key. Okay? So initially it is empty, and then what we do is we simply traverse the linked list, uh, starting with the first node and going all the way to the end. And um, for each node that we are looking at, we get its key and simply insert it into the queue, right? And finally return the queue. And why is it okay to return uh, an object of type Q here? Well, because we know that Qs are iterable. So that's a perfectly uh, reasonable thing to return, right? Um, so so what, uh, that's exactly what we do. So we create a queue 
and we simply store all the keys in the symbol table inside of that queue and return that queue. Right. So that's how we implement the basic symbol table API using uh, a linked list as the underlying data structure. Now let's talk about implementing the ordered symbol table API. And for this, we're going to use an array as the underlying data structure, right? So this implementation is called binary search ST. And uh, the keys and values are both uh, generic types, okay? But here, since it's an implementation of the ordered symbol table API, we insist that the keys be comparable. Right? So the keys have, you know, have to be comparable in order to implement the ordered operations. Okay, um, <clears throat> so let's uh, now talk about the instance variables. So we first uh, uh, define a constant called init capacity and set it to the value two. Uh, and, uh, and then we have two arrays, two static arrays, one called keys that is going to store the keys in the symbol table and another parallel array called vals that's going to store the corresponding values, right? And keys and vals, they, uh, they're going to have exactly the same size, right? So these are the, the underlying arrays that we're going to use to store the keys and values, okay? Um, and then n simply stores the number of key value pairs in the simple table. All right. Now this implementation is called binary search ST because to implement the get operation, we're going to use uh, binary search. All right. And since we're going to be using binary search, we need to make sure that the keys are always sorted. All right. So, so we're always going to maintain that. Uh, we're going to maintain uh, the keys uh, in sorted order. Okay. So now let's look at the methods. Uh, the constructor, uh, we have two constructors, one that um, uh, builds an empty symbol table. Um, so this one simply calls this other constructor, giving it two for initial capacity, right? And then this constructor takes capacity as an argument and sets up the underlying arrays with that given capacity, right? So the first one, uh, uh, the first constructor builds an empty symbol table where the underlying arrays have a capacity of two, okay, because that's the value of this constant. And this constructor sets up an empty symbol table uh, where the underlying arrays have the given capacity. All right. And recall that this as a method called refers to a constructor. All right. Okay. So that's that, and both constructors are constant time operations. And then we have the private resize method okay, that takes a capacity as an argument and simply resizes uh, the underlying arrays to that capacity. So we build two temporary arrays, one for keys, one for values, with that capacity. Right? And then we simply copy over the keys from keys and vals um, uh, into the temporary arrays for keys and vals. And then we simply say the new vals array is temp3 and the new keys array is temp k, right? Okay, um, and then um, we implement the contains method using the get method. So we make a call to get on the given key if that comes back with something other than null, we return true. If it comes back with null, we return false, saying that the key is not in the symbol table. Size simply returns n, and then is empty simply returns uh, a, a comparison of size with zero, right? So size and is empty are both constant time operation. Contains relies on get. So the running time for contains is basically whatever the running time for get is, and we're going to talk about that uh, soon, okay? All right, now let's um, look at the get method, all right? But get relies on the implementation of the rank method. Uh, so let's, um, uh, uh, see how the rank method works first, and then we will come back to the get method. So rank, remember, t 
takes a key as an argument and it returns the number of keys uh, that are strictly less than the given key in the symbol table. Okay, so it simply reports on the number of keys in the symbol table that are strictly less than the given key. Another way to think about rank is uh, as follows. If you were to insert this particular key in the uh, symbol table, then this rank of that key is going to denote its index in the underlying array. Okay, so recall that the underlying array keeps the keys in sorted order. So if you were to insert this uh, key in there, um, its rank is going to denote the position where it's going to end up. Right? So that's another way to think about it. And the way we implement rank is using binary search. Right? So this, uh, what you see here is, uh, is basically binary search. Okay, so we initialize low to zero and high to n minus one. Right, so these are the two pointers, low and high. And then as long as low is less than or equal to high, meaning they have not uh, crossed sides, we say middle is simply low plus high minus low divided by two. Right, so that's the pointer to the middle element. And then we simply compare the given key with the element that is pointed to by m, the middle index. Right? So we compare the given key with keys at m. And if the given key is smaller, in which case CMP is going to be negative, we simply say high is m minus 1. Right? Uh, so this uh, is saying that if the given key is smaller than the middle key, then we are not going to find this key on the right half. So simply now look for it in the left half. So that's the standard binary search idea. Okay. But what if CMP is greater than zero? That would mean that the given key is larger than the middle key, in which case we adjust low to be m plus one. Right? And if it's a match, uh, then we simply return m. Right? Um, and once the loop is done, we end up returning low. Okay? So so that's how rank works, right? It, it uses binary search to return the number of keys in the symbol table that are strictly less than the given key, right? Okay, so now let's go back to the get method and see how that's implemented. Um, so we first check if the symbol table is empty. If so, we return null. Right? Otherwise, what we do is we get the rank of the given key by making a call to this method, right? and that is stored in i. Okay? So now remember, i is the number of elements in the symbol table that are strictly less than the given key. And then what we do is we check if i is strictly less than n, and if the keys at i is the same as the given key. Right? If it is, then we know that we have uh, 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 that this key is in the symbol table, in which case we return the corresponding value. Okay. Otherwise, we end up returning null, meaning the given key is not in the symbol table. All right. Now, why do we need this check? Well, what if I came back with uh, uh, with the value n? Well, that would mean that all the, the keys in the symbol table are strictly less than the given key, which means that the given key is not in the symbol table. So we return null in that case, okay? So we need this check here to guard against that one case where i could be precisely uh, uh, n, right? Um, okay. Um, and then you know uh, we also need this uh, guard so that we can use i as an index into the array, because these uh, 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 because only then you know uh, it would be a valid index only if i is strictly less than n. All right. Okay. Um, so that's how get works. And what is the running time of get? Well, it's basically the running time for rank. And rank is binary search, and we know that if you have a collection with n keys, then binary search takes time proportional to log of n. So rank is a logarithmic operation, and get, which relies on rank, is also a logarithmic operation. Right? 
So the running time of both get and rank are uh, uh, log of n. And now we know what the running time of contains method is from the previous slide. That is also log of n because that relies on the get method. Okay. All right. Now there's one other point to make, which is that notice uh, we need this check as well. Okay. Uh, right after getting rank, we cannot simply return uh, the vals uh, at i, okay? Because we need to check if uh, this key is in the symbol table or, or not. Uh, just because i is less than n doesn't mean that key is in the symbol table, right? So we need this check as well. Okay, um, okay so now let's talk about the put method. So in put, we get a key value pair that we want to insert into the symbol table. And the first thing that we do is check the val and see if it is null. If so, then our convention says that it's a delete operation. So we simply call delete on the given key and return. Otherwise, what we do is we make a call to rank, right? Giving it the key as an argument. And then we have a check that is similar to what we had here. So if i is strictly less than n, and if the keys at i uh, uh, dot compared to of key is zero, then it means that uh, this key is already in the symbol table. So what do we do in that case as per our convention? Well, we simply update the corresponding value to the given value, right? So we say vals at i equals val, and we return. So this is the case where the key is already, so the given key exists in the symbol table, right? So in that case, we simply update the value. But if we end up here, then it would mean that the given key is not in the symbol table. So in that case, we need to make a new uh, entry for this key value pair. But the first thing we do before we insert the key value pair is you know, check if there is room in the underlying uh, array for that new uh, key, okay? So we compare n with keys dot length. So if n is the same as the capacity of the keys array, we resize uh, both keys and vals to twice its current capacity, right? And then what we do is in this for loop, okay, what we uh, do is j starts at n and then it uh, it goes uh, in you know, steps of negative one all the way up to i, and then we say keys at j uh, equals keys at j minus one, and vals at j is vals at j minus one. So what are we doing here? Well, we know that we need to insert, so we have keys and vals, so these are two arrays, they're parallel arrays, Right? And we've, we know where we need to insert uh, the new key value pair. They need to go uh, here, all right? So what are we doing in this for loop? Well, in this for loop, we're simply creating a slot at the index i, right? So we start j at n. So j starts um, there at n and we simply uh, uh, move an element from before to that index, all right? So we move this element over. Similarly here, we move this value over, and then we move this one over, this one over, and so on. And then this guy gets moved, this guy gets moved, and then we stop when we get to, when j becomes high, and that is where the given key value pair is going to end up. So we simply say keys at i equals key and vals at i equals val. And n is incremented by one because we're inserting a new key value pair, okay? So what we're doing here in this for loop is basically shifting elements to the right. All the elements you know, from i onwards is shifted one to the right, just to allow for the new key value pair, okay? So this is where the new key is going to end up and this is where the corresponding val is going to end up. All right, so that's uh, uh, the put operation. Um, and because of this uh, uh, movement of keys and values, uh, the put operation is a linear time operation, all right? 
because in the worst case uh, uh, you know the the place where you want to uh, insert the new key value pair might be at the very beginning in which case you have to move everything over to the right by one so that's a linear time operation all right okay so now let's talk about the delete operation um, so here it's, uh, it's kind of like the reverse of the put operation. We first check if the symbol table is empty. If so, we return. There's nothing to do. Otherwise, we get the rank of the given key by making a call to the rank method. Okay. And here, if we, if we check if i is equal to n or if key set i dot compared to of key is not equal to zero. Okay. So what are we saying uh, uh, here? Um, so if um, if i is n, so that means every key in the symbol table is less than the given key, right? Uh, which means that the given key is not in the symbol table, so there's nothing to delete. Or if key z i is different from the given key, this again means that uh, uh, this key is not in the symbol table. So in that case, again, there is nothing to do, so we return. But if we end up here, then we know that we have identified a key value pair to delete. So what do we do in this case? Well, this is the, the reverse of what we did in put. Instead of moving things to the right, we move things to the left, right? So we are looking at, so this is the keys array and this is the vals array. So, um, um, so here, what we do is we say, we say keys at j is keys at j plus one. So if this is j, then the element at j plus one is moved into it. Okay. Same thing for value. And then this guy gets moved there, this guy gets moved there, and so on and so on. Right? So we, we move, um, uh, so starting uh, with uh, i, we move everything from the right uh, uh, to the left by one. Right? And that has the effect of removing the, L, the key value pair at i itself. Right? So j starts at i, and then we move everything to the right of it to the left by one. Okay, and then since we are removing a key value pair, we decrement n by one, and then we say, say the keys at n and vals at n is null. So we do this to uh, to prevent loitering, right? So that last slot is now just because of this movement. What we have is um, uh, the the last slot. We simply have something that's uh, uh, that we set to null, right, uh, at the index n. And then here we check if uh, um, uh, n is the quarter of the capacity, meaning if the number of keys and values in the symbol table is a quarter of the capacity, we simply shrink the array to half of its current capacity, right? So that's the last bit. Okay, so what is the running time of delete? Again, because of this movement of data, um, this is a linear time operation because in the worst case we end up moving n keys and values all right uh, to the left by one okay so that's delete now let's talk about the next operation delete min um, so we first check if the symbol table is empty or not if so we throw an exception because you're not allowed to delete from an empty table uh, otherwise, what we do is we make a call to the delete operation, which we just discussed, giving it the minimum key as an argument, which we obtain by making a call to the min method, which we will look at later on. Right? So we simply call min, which returns the minimum key in the symbol table, the smallest key, and we use that as an argument to delete it, uh, um, uh, uh, to the delete method, right? which ends up deleting that key. Uh, what about delete max? It's exactly the same idea. So we first report an error if the symbol table is already empty. Otherwise, we make a call to the max method, which returns the largest key in the symbol table. And we use that as an argument to the delete method to remove the largest key. What about the min method? Well, that's uh, uh, straightforward. So if the symbol table is empty, we return null. Otherwise, we simply return uh, the key at index zero. Remember that keys is ordered, right? So keys, uh, we always maintain it uh, ordered. So the smallest key sits at index zero and that's what we end up returning. 
What about max? Exactly the opposite. Since the key's array is ordered, the largest key is at index n minus 1, so that's what we return here, right? Okay, and uh, what are uh, the running times of these operations? Well, min and max are clearly constant time operation because it's uh, it simply involves indexing an array, right? Um, what about delete min and delete uh, max? Well, uh, they rely on the delete operation, so it's basically the running time of delete, which was uh, uh, linear in the worst case. Okay. What about the floor operation? So recall that floor is supposed to return the largest uh, key in the symbol table that is less than or equal to the given key. So here we again make use of the rank method. So we simply call rank on the given key and that we store in i. And if i is strictly less than zero and if this comparison is true, then it means that the given key is in the symbol table. So we simply return keys at i, right? Otherwise, uh, uh, we check if i is 0 or not. If i is 0, what would it mean? It means that there is no key uh, that is uh, uh, strictly less than the given key, right? Meaning the given key is the smallest uh, key, okay? So in that case, we end up returning null because that is uh, uh, the, the, the floor, right? Because there is no key that is less than, uh, in the symbol table that is less than the given key, right? Otherwise, we end up returning keys at i minus 1 because that is the largest key that is uh, less than uh, the given key, right? So this is true when the given key is in the symbol table, in which case we return the key itself. This is true when um, the uh, uh, given key is not in the symbol table, all right? Uh, and if it were to be inserted in the symbol table, it would have an index 0 in which case its floor is simply null. And then this is true when there is a key in the symbol table that is the largest key that is strictly less than the given key, right? So, so that's that. And what's the running time of floor? Well, because of the rank operation, it is uh, um, logarithmic. What about ceiling? Well, here again, uh, 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 we make use of rank. So recall that ceiling is supposed to return the smallest key in the symbol table that is greater than or equal to the given key, right? So we first call rank on the given key and store the rank in i. And then if i is n, we return null because what does it mean for i to be equal to n? It means that all the uh, keys in the symbol table um, are um, less than the given key, right? So in that case, we, you know, th th there is no ceiling for the given key, so we return null. Otherwise, we simply return keys at i as the largest key that is, um, um, uh, as the smallest key that is less than, uh, 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 sorry. So otherwise, we end up returning keys at i as the smallest key that is greater than the given key. What about the size method? Well, size is supposed to return the number of keys that are between low and high, both low and high inclusive. So what we do is we first simply compare low with high. If low is greater than high, right, uh, then we return zero, right? Because there is nothing be uh, uh, between uh, uh, low and high. But what if um, otherwise we end up returning one of two things? Uh, if i is actually in the symbol table, in which case this is going to be true, we simply return the rank of i okay, minus the rank of low plus 1 because i is in the symbol table. Otherwise, if i is not in the symbol table, we simply return the rank of i minus rank of low. Right? Again, recall that rank of i simply returns the number of elements that are strictly less than i. From that, we subtract the number of elements that are strictly less than low, which gives you the number of elements between low and high, okay? So that's that. 
and the size operation is logarithmic because we uh, make use of the rank operation which is logarithmic um, finally um, the keys method uh, which is an overloaded method is implemented as follows so this particular key uh, keys method which is supposed to return all the keys uh, in the symbol table as an iterable object relies on this keys method so it simply calls this guy giving it min for low and max for high okay so uh, here we are simply returning all the keys that are between min and max okay. what do we do here well we are given two keys low and high and we are supposed to return an iterable object that contains the keys between low and high in sorted order okay. so uh, we create a key which is an iterable object right and in, uh, sorry we create a queue an empty queue um, which we know is iterable so that's a perfectly good thing to return also all that we need to do is fill that queue with the keys from this uh, range right so we first uh, uh, check if low is null and high is null in which case we return the empty queue otherwise we check if low is null uh, meaning one of them is null we throw an exception so if low or high is null it's an exception right otherwise we check if low is greater than uh, high in which case again we return the empty queue right because there is nothing between low and high in that case otherwise what we do is i starts at the rank of low and goes all the way up to rank of high and we simply uh, uh, nq keys at i into the queue right um, and then finally we need this additional check which checks if high is actually in the symbol table if so we enqueue um, uh, that as well right um, and finally we return that queue okay? so queue is going to contain the keys that are between low and high both inclusive right So now let's uh, uh, talk about the performance characteristics of uh, the two implementations that we discussed. Now when we study symbol table implementations, we typically count comparisons and rarely we uh, uh, count array accesses. Okay, so we typically work with uh, comparisons and then in rare cases where comparisons are not in the inner loop, we make, uh, uh, we count array accesses, right? So here, what we are looking at is the cost summary for the two symbol table implementations that we have discussed. One using an unordered linked list, which is what we use to implement the basic symbol table API, and the other one using an ordered array. Right? So here, uh, so uh, that's what we uh, used to implement the ordered symbol table API. So here, um, uh, keys was ordered. Okay. All right, so what is the running time of the two fundamental operations in each of these implementations? The two fundamental operations in a symbol table are search and insert. So search, in the case of an unordered linked list, is a linear time operation, because in the worst case, you have to scan the entire list. What about ordered array? Well, it's logarithmic because we use binary search. Insert, in the worst case, is a linear time operation with the linked list based implementation and it is also a linear time operation in the uh, uh, ordered array implementation right because here uh, it, i mean this operation involves finding the right place um, uh, uh, for the key and then inserting things at that place and moving things around and so on right so it's a linear time operation uh, and then in the average case, search is linear in the linked list based implementation and it's logarithmic in the ordered array implementation and insert in the average case is linear in both implementations, right? Now, the linked list based implementation only supports the basic symbol table API. So it does not support ordered operations. It simply cannot, right? It cannot efficiently support ordered operations. Whereas the ordered array based implementation does support the ordered operations um, these are operations like you know like min and max and floor and ceiling and so on so this implementation did support those operations very efficiently right so that concludes this um, lecture on symbol tables um, thanks for your time